Hello and welcome to Analysis with me, Oliver McTernan. In this programme, we're discussing the complex and diverse legacy of the former Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, who died last Saturday, aged 85. In this half of the programme, we will be discussing how his legacy has affected attempts to bring forward peace negotiations while Sharon did signal a change in direction in 2005 with the removal of all Jewish settlers from the Gaza Strip. Many claimed that this was a cynical move to consolidate more valuable settlements in the West Bank. Speaking to Haaretz, Sharon's former chief of staff, Dov Weiglas, said of the withdrawal, the significance of the disengagement plan is the freezing of the peace process. And when you freeze that process, you prevent the establishment of a Palestinian state, and you prevent a discussion on the refugees, the borders, and Jerusalem. Effectively, this whole package called the Palestinian state, with all that it entails, has been removed indefinitely from our agenda. The Disengagement is actually for Malahite. It supplies the amount that is necessary so there will be a political process. There will be not a political process with the Palestinians. Now, joining me to discuss this in the studio are Paul Ussiskin, writer on Middle Eastern affairs, Nassim Ahmed, researcher at the Palestinian Return Center, and on the phone, we're joined by Dr. Fadi Abusidu, Foreign Relations Commission representative for FAT in the UK. And by Skype, we are joined by Professor Yossi Meckelberg, Research Fellow at the Middle East and North Africa program at Chatham House. Welcome to you. Nassim, do you think Sharon's withdrawal actually froze the whole peace process? Well, the whole pro peace process, I don't think, really was underway, to be honest with you. And uh, since Sharon's death, there's an interesting writing, rewriting of history, uh, a, a counterfactual writing of history, which is that if Sharon did not go into coma and it did, his primacy did not come to an abrupt end, somehow he would have also withdrawn from the West Bank like he did from Gaza. If you, if you carry Sharon's logic, his personality, his psychology, and his strategic thinking to his logical conclusion, there was no way Sharon would have done that. He, his retrenchment from Gaza was the logical, you know, logi logical step to entrench within the West Bank. Gaza has no significance to the Israelis historically and also militarily. But the West Bank is far more important than Jer Jerusalem, Hebron. These are far more important to I Israelis than Gaza. So there's no way he would have actually withdrawn from the West Bank. And uh, okay. yeah, so, so th th this rewriting of history, um, to me, is, is, is totally, totally wrong. If he really wanted peace, even in 2002, the Arab, Arab League offered him uh, uh, the Arab Initiative, which is based on the international consensus on a two-state solution. So if he really wanted that, then he would have actually grabbed that by the hands and pursued with that. But Sharon wants peace in his own terms, in his own ways, not under the guidelines and the framework of international law, but yeah. in his own terms. These are, these are the clear thinking logic behind Sharon's policies. Uh, Yossi, would you agree with that, that it was the withdrawal from Gaza was more a, a cynical move that sort of to prevent further progress in, in any establishment of a Palestinian state? Or do you think it was a historic moment which, had he lived, he would have um, moved further and withdrew from the West Bank? Well, I, I agree with the gist of what has been said. It was, on one hand, it was an historical uh, move by, by Sharon, and he took on his own party, actually uh, shuttered his own party in order to do that and, and build a new party, and it was a very Sharon-like action. So in this sense, it was, and I was actually during the disengagement in Gaza and to see the removal of the settlements took a lot of Israel's energy and to see uh, Israeli soldiers removing the settlers. So it was a big, big event and a big step by Sharon. But this was not 
an act by men of peace. And that's how I agree when there is a bit of rewriting of history. Because Eddie wanted peace, he had to negotiate it with the PLO at the time. What he did, he removed the settlements there, left Gaza and asked the PLO, you would become our subcontractors for uh, security. You look after our own security without actually negotiating properly with them. I think in many cases he strengthened the Hamas by doing that because the myth of the Hamas pushing the Israelis out of Gaza, make them run away from Gaza, while the Fatah is not even considered by Sharon as 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 negotiating uh, partner, created long term uh, long term uh, damage to the peace process. Moreover, yes, he might have withdraw from the West Bank, but then without addressing the other core issue, no Jerusalem, no refugee, no water. So he probably would have looked for capitulation from the Palestinians. He would have looked for to dictate the process. And this is not the way peace is done. It has to be negotiated, agreed, and many make both sides unhappy equally. Buddy, you were saying in the first half of the program how the way he um, brought about the withdrawal, the fact it was a unilateral action without negotiation, it created a sort of political vacuum for you. Could you expand more on that, please? Sure. Uh, first of all, I need to mention that the settlers who were removed from Gaza uh, in this unilateral withdrawal were relocated to settlements in the West Bank. So it was not a matter of uh, uh, de-settlementizing the Palestinian territories. On the contrary, and uh, in the initial idea behind the, the, the unilateral withdrawal was to only withdraw from Gaza and not to have any withdrawal from any area in the West Bank. And only thanks to uh, tremendous pressure we put on the Americans and the European parties, we saw a very limited uh, number of withdrawal of, uh, of settlements in the West Bank in the same move in order to ensure that legally and politically the Palestinian territories are treated equally and not differently, which will have tremendous implications in the future. However, politically, when it comes to withdrawing from Gaza, what we heard from Israeli officials afterwards is that we have withdrawn from Gaza now. The Palestinians are in front of a test. Either they prove that they are state-worthy, they are capable of providing security, building institutions in Gaza, or uh, they, uh, we cannot go forward with, in the negotiations. And that was the, the, the main motive behind this unilateral move in this particular uh, un uncoordinated way, to put an argument forward that Palestinians are now in front of a test. We will wait until they succeed. We will wait and see how they perform. And then we will consider negotiating with them on a larger area, which have diverted that track of the peace negotiations and the peace process tremendously from its, uh, its course. Uh, uh, I agree with uh, most of what uh, the previous speakers have said. Yossi, yes. Paul, um, are we giving too much attention to the Sharon legacy? Do you, in fact, think it's still shaping the, the course of peace in the region? I think we're kind of fixated on a larger-than-life personality. Uh, in my book, this is the, uh, the psychopath, the national psychopath you either love or you hate. Uh, and by most definitions of psychopathy, he certainly fits part of it. No empathy, very little empathy for either his own troops or his enemy, and no apparent moral paradigm. Um, now what you have to do is look and see who comes next. And if you watch the current lineup of people, for quite clearly Bibi Netanyahu is not a strong man. And the chances of his leading a peace process are limited by the complexity of his own cabinet. So you have to look beyond who then comes next to fill the, the empty shoes, if you like, that Ariel Sharon leaves behind. And I get a lot of flack for saying this one, but I think Avigdor Lieberman, who seems to have gone through something of a recreation, mostly at the hands of the Americans in the last three or four weeks, saying rather positive things about the Kerry Initiative, is positioning himself. And let's forget for a moment everything else we know and like about him. Just remember, this guy is known as a political bully. So in some senses, he does fit that mold. Um, Yossi Lieberman, the new political bulldozer? 
he, he might be, but he's not the one that I will look up to to bring peace. I really think that in a way, and, and, and Paul is a person that was in the peace movement for so long, I think the peace movement start to looking for someone from the right and falling into the trap that the right in Israel uh, actually lied to, lied to us in saying that only the right wing can bring peace because they are tough. I beg to differ. I think actually it's time for people that believe in peace, believe in truth and reconciliation, will take the leadership and not fall into the trap that only the, the, the right wing, because they are tough, because they are not a wishy-washy liberals apparently, that will give up the, the interest, the security interest of Israel. No, it, there must be a negotiator that believes that there is a possibility for peace with the Palestinian and the Arab world, and someone that has a vision of Israel as a state in the Middle East. And I don't think Lieberman is the one that can lead it, especially not one that thinks that just willy-nilly he can remove uh, Israeli citizens and to tell them goodbye, you are not Israeli citizens anymore because we are going to negotiate with the Palestinian, moving you to be Palestinian citizens. I don't think this kind of person is a real peace, uh, someone believes in peace in the long term. We need a, a vision of peace and not peace just as a sort of treaty. They look at it as a ceasefire, as strategic repositioning, but not as long-term vision for truth and reconciliation with the Arab world. N Nassim, you are an advocate on behalf of Palestinian rights and a Palestinian state. What hope have you of seeing any progress coming from these current peace talks? Well, we started talking about uh, Lieberman. Uh, one of the things he said uh, just recently was that even if there is a Palestinian state, uh, there will be no right of Palestinian refugees to return even to a Palestinian state, let alone return to their original homes in um, great historic Palestine. Uh, so with someone who is, who is going to um, be so stubborn on one of the most central, if not the central question on the Palestinian issue, you can't really see a, a serious negotiation within the Palestinians for a state. But, so I, 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 I can't Nassim, really... I don't, I don't like to find myself in a position of defending Ariel Sharon <laughs> or Avigdor Lieberman, but uh, Lieberman, who lives in Nokdim, a settlement in the West Bank, is on record as saying for peace he would be prepared to evacuate his own settlement. Yeah. I don't know if these are throwaway lines, but in his milieu, that's yeah. not something you can ignore. No, you can't ignore these things, but in the overall scheme of things, we've got to look at what, how important is one settlement, his settlement, within the overall scheme of things. Is, pretty, is, 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 is Israel willing to uh, give up East Jerusalem? Is Israel willing to allow Palestinian refugees to return, at least to the Palestinian state? Most Palestinians by international law have a right to return to where they came from and compensation, all those things. But within the peace process, there is, of course, a redefinition of what the right to return means, which is to return to Palestinian state. Yeah. So even on that concession, he's not willing to uh, allow Palestinians return. So I can't see how any kind of negotiation with the framework that exists right now, with the characters and actors and the pathology of people like Lieberman and Netanyahu, that you can actually bring about uh, a Palestinian state. Uh, Fadi, um, you've been listening to this. Now, you have been part of negotiations for a long period. Have you detected any notable difference from the time of Sharon to the present? Do you think some of these new actors, as we've spoke of, uh, uh, offer more hope than you had when Sharon was prime minister? When Sharon was prime minister, he represented the left, the, the right. Today, Sharon represents, well, a position adopted by Sharon represents the middle, which shows you how much right the whole Israeli paradigm or Israeli politics has shifted. And however, just to comment quickly on, on the uh, last discussion, uh, understanding the characteristics and political uh, structure of the Israeli society, you need, in order to become a, an Israeli leader capable of bringing Israel into peace and pay the price that is needed, you need more than just the vote of the Israeli settlers. You need a broader coalition, a consensus, and you, you are a very sexy leader in Israel if you have a military background. And uh, what we are going to witness in the coming period is an escalation in terms of race between potential candidates who want to uh, become the, Israeli, the next Israeli prime minister. And I think Moshe Yalon 
is gonna be one of the main uh, main front runners in that sense, in, in that race. However, uh, it's very important to remember that the nine month period for nego- current negotiations will end in April, and when that deadline comes, the Palestinians will go forward in terms of trying to achieve their rights uh, and using legitimate international means. Now, Israel needs to understand that it can, the situation cannot continue, settlement is counterproductive, and uh, that these points need to be factored in in any leadership race in Israel. Um, Yossi, throughout this program, we've been looking at the Sharon legacy. Now, it was said in after the withdrawal from Gaza, when he set up the Kadima party, it was an attempt at a realignment of Israeli politics. But if you look at the Knesset today and you see that there are only two seats out of 120, the Kadima party, do you think he failed in that action? Well, you know, because he, he slipped into coma shortly after founding the Kadima and after the disengagement, it's one of this what if in history that we'll never know. I believe that it, had he stayed as a political leader, probably the Kadima party would have won even with a bigger majority or at least positions have better to form a coalition. In, in, in the election in, in, in 2006. And, and probably, you know, history would have looked to be different. And I, th- I, I, I thought, I believe that he, 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 la- he wanted to disengage also in the, in the West Bank. I just, one of those that don't believe that this is the way to move forward. Mm. And I don't believe in unilateralism in diplomacy. Uh, it's actually contradict contradiction in terms. If you want, either you do diplomacy and you negotiate and you deal. And I'm not suggesting that the Palestinians are necessarily easy partners, but that's the one that you, we need to negotiate with. And Sharon had no interest in that. He mm-hmm. wanted to dictate. I, I think following uh, the election 2006, as he stayed the prime minister, he probably would become a stronger leader and had the more room to maneuver. What he would have done with that is a, is, is a good question. I'm not so yeah. sure I have a good answer. What he would have done, Paul, is a good question. But I'd just like to move on and get your thoughts on why were there so few international leaders, do you think, present at his funeral? Um, the overall commentary about the funeral was it lacked emotion, um, and there were a few statements. I think. The, the, if you like, the no-show of top-grade leaders from the outside world is an indication of the predicament that the outside world found itself in in the middle of negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians, however complex these are and however unknown they are. You don't want to rock that boat because those leaders on the outside understand what Yossi is saying, that diplomacy has its own dynamic and you really shouldn't try and interrupt it. So you end up with a vice president talking about uh, Sharon in very careful language, a complex man, a leader in a complex time for a complex set of circumstances. He couldn't say what I just said about him. There's too much at stake. So Mm. this current initiative, a lot about which we know very little, is actually something that everybody else seems to be holding very, very dear. And that, for, for that reason, the, the, the funeral didn't have a lot of people making more statements. Mm. It would have embarrassed them to, to come and, and say that. And Fadi, were you surprised at the lack of international representation? I think the funeral is a sign that there is still hope that uh, a legacy that is full of blood uh, and death and murder, like the legacy of Sharon, uh, will not be as popular as some predicted. And that is a positive sign that people will disengage from such a person. Na- Nassim, we, we have many figures in history. If you go back and look at their legacy, their early legacy, they have a lot of blood on their hands, yet they managed to change and, and do good things, you might say. Um, do you think this would have been a possibility had Sharon lived? I. I can't see how you could wipe out Sharon's legacy. Um, the, I don't think there is a comparable legacy of another current leader, prime minister, who actually would have been, uh, should have been on, or 
held for war crimes and uh, crime against humanity after the massacre in Sabra and Shatila. So for someone who, who was, as I said, who was too extreme, even for Menachem Begin, who was actually fired by him because of his brutality within uh, in Sabra and Shatila and the invasion of Lebanon, where 50,000 people had actually died. I can't see any other leader who is comparable in that sense. So his funeral and the lack of attendance is really an indictment on, on Sharon and really an indictment on Israeli leaders, I would think. There aren't many Israeli leaders who I would think if they were to pass away now, you would have such a, a clamor for global leaders to actually attend their funerals. I don't think that would be the case. Yossi, um, can you, in a few words, um, tell us what you think the Sharon legacy will be? I think it's a complex uh, legacy. I think he left a huge legacy within the Israeli army for better and for worse. He was a brave soldier. I think he was a patriot in his own eyes. He thought he did what, you know, what was for the best of, of the country. A lot of us uh, disagreed fundamentally with his approach. And my fear that the legacy is... Uh, in many ways is one that the way to deal with in a complex neighborhood, as, as Joe Biden said, was to use force and not to use diplomacy. And that's part of his, his unfortunate uh, legacy that he talked about no partners. On the other hand, I think also he left also a legacy he was the first prime minister that mentioned the word occupation that no other prime minister there to say before him admitting that is a presence. Sorry, Yossi, to cut you off it's there, but Fadi, a few words, the Sharon legacy. Um, for the Palestinians, he will always be remembered for Sabra and Shatila. That's his legacy uh, as far as we are concerned. Nassim? Well, as I said, it, he, his legacy has been uh, a, a brutal blow for peace and for the Palestinians, definitely, and for peace in the region as well. That's what I would say, Paul. I'd speak for the soldiers, one of whom turned up in Haaret today, yesterday, he talked about what it was like being a soldier under him, under Sharon, going into Lebanon. His view of Sharon, and Yossi talked about the, the military legacy, so I, I finish with that. Whatever Sharon did, Sharon did for Sharon. He didn't do it for anybody else. So if it cost 38 dead and 120 injured crossing into the Mitla Pass in 1956, if it cost 450 Israeli soldiers and 1,200 casualties to cross the canal, so he crossed the canal. That's not a legacy that you would want to hold on to, in my humble opinion, but it is, in some quarters of the army, glorified. A controversial, complex figure. Thank you for being with us this evening. That's all time we have for our discussion tonight. Please do join us again tomorrow.